Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Pauline Pastorate, online Bible study on the book of First Timothy. Last week, we settled the understanding of what a servant is as compared to the word slave. Now, essentially, we have learned that a servant is a role and a function meant to carry out service in subjection to a master willfully. That's the key word, willfully. While a slave, on the other hand, is a social condition in which one is forced into servitude and subjection. Again, the difference is the matter of choice and free will in the rendition of the service. Now, as we have mentioned before in our study last week, it only makes sense for the scriptures to address servants since it evokes their will to honor and obey their masters after the flesh whom they serve. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to charge or command slaves who have no choice in their servitude to serve, honor, or even obey their masters since they have no choice in the matter to begin with. Hence, the word servants as rendered by the King James Bible is the God-intended word to be in our Bibles. Now, with this in mind, let me direct your attention to our passage for consideration tonight, which is from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 1. So let me read to you what the Word of God says. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and His doctrine be not blaspheme. Now, before we exposit our passage this evening, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can see the instructions from your word regarding servants and how they regard their masters with all honor. Tonight, Father, I pray that you would help us to see the things you want us to see, and may your spirit of wisdom and revelation enlighten the eyes of our understanding help us to ponder upon these things even as we hear and heed the instructions of our apostle in jesus name amen and amen the title of our study this evening is pollen instructions for believing servants and this is part one which regards the servant and their masters in general now we begin with our passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. And the first step in studying an epistle is actually to determine the main clause, which in verse 1 is simply the sentence, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. The subject is servants, which we have learned previously in our study last week means simply the willful choice to render service. Hence, they are given charge regarding their honoring of their masters in this particular passage. Now, as we have mentioned last week, that definition of the word servant is actually derived from the etymology, which in, in the 12th century, it's from the word servant, which means male or female personal or domestic attendant, one owing duty of service to a master or lord, one employed by another and subject to his orders. That's the root word. That's the history of the word servant. Servant. That is why the definition goes, as the Noah Webster puts it, as a person male or female, that attends another for the purpose of performing menial offices for him or who is employed by another for such offices or for other labor and is subject to his command. Now, one thing that we would notice with the etymology and in the definition is that both would agree and concur that the servant is one employed by another 
and subject to his orders. That's the etymology. And in the servant, it's also the word employed by another for such offices or for other labor. Hence, from here, we could safely and exegetically make the present-day connection between what is called a servant-master relationship in the Bible times is the same in some ways with the employee-employer relationship of modern times. Hence, we would see that doing so, we would see the correlative terms between culture in which Paul's original audience is set with our present-day audience today, maintaining indeed that the scriptures are given by inspiration, which are presently inspired, and is profitable, presently profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, such correlation is not plausible if we will wrongfully use the word slave, knowing that slavery is a cultural and social condition and does not transcend does not transcend the cultural norms and situations at that time and our time today hence we would put the correlation when we look at the word servant in the king james bible we understand the word servant as an employee or one employed that's the keyword to do a work the masters therefore are ones who are employers or who hires for work to be done now it's interesting because the sentence or the phrase as are under the yoke doesn't speak about the bondage of slavery since a servant has choice in it rather in our present time this could be understood as a contract or an agreement between an employee and an employer regarding the roles and responsibilities of both parties. This is the same as a contract or agreement. By using these terms, we would understand the correlation between the word servant and the present-day employee master and the present-day employer and under the yoke with a contract and agreement. This is not possible if we use the word slave, wherein the slaves have no choice in the matter. However, the contention of many would say, but wait a minute, the Greek word that is used in the passages is the word doulos. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 in the Nestle Allen text uses the word douloi, which is the plural of the word doulos. And the lexicons would say and suggest that the word doulos is rendered as slaves. That is why the New American Standard Bible and other modern Bibles either renders this slaves or bond slaves or bond servants. The picture is it's the lowest form of the word slave, one that doesn't have rights. Now, that wouldn't make sense. Why would you command someone who don't have rights, does it, that, that, that doesn't have a choice in the matter, to honor, obey, respect, or be loyal to their masters? It simply wouldn't make sense. However, an important thing to know is that there are actually many underlying Greek words that are rendered servant in the King James Bible consistently, slave, bond servant, or bond slaves by modern Bibles. Now, these are the underlying Greek words that are rendered servant consistently in the King James. Number one is the word doulos, which is actually the most common one. It occurs 124 times in the New Testament that comprises about 81% of its actual usage. The second would be oikites, which is used 2.61%. Diakonos, which we get the modern word deacon, 
occurring 4.57%. The word pais is fairly common, which occurs 6.53%. The word huperites, 2.61%. The word mistotos, 1.96%. And the most rare, occurring only one time, is the word terapone, which is comprising of only 0.65%. Now, in the plethora of the underlying words for the Greek word rendered for servant, there's one thing that we also have to understand, that these terms are used interchangeably in the King James Bible. Consider, let me present occurrences from the book of Matthew wherein there's a shift between one term that's rendered servant that wouldn't make sense if it's rendered a different term within the context. Number one, case number one, is the word pais to the word doulos within the same pericope. Now, this can be found in Matthew chapter 8, verse 6 to 13. Now, this will be talking about the centurion that came to Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 6, he would tell the Lord Jesus Christ of his predicament, where he says, And saying, Lord, my servant. Now, that's the word pais, rendered by the King James Bible as servant. Lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Now, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant, pais, shall be healed. Now, in the context... A centurion comes to the Lord Jesus for his servant. He's confident that Jesus would just say the word and his servant, Pais, would be healed. But here's the shift. Now, the centurion gives Jesus his illustration regarding being a person under authority, where he says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, doulos, do this, and he doeth. Now, why is there a change? Why would a, why would a centurion use an illustration introducing a new term when it's not what he is actually telling Christ for. Unless, of course, like what the King James did, they rendered it the same thing. If this is about a servant getting healed, this is about a servant getting moved to be done the master's bidding. So the servant says, and the centurion says, do this and he do it, and Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto him that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Now, notice the shift later on when he says, And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant, Pais, back to the very beginning, was healed in the, cell, in the self same hour. Think about it. It wouldn't make sense if the Pais and the Dulos actually mean different things, unless... Christ, the writer Matthew, the centurion themselves are talking about the same thing, referring to the same term, which is rendered as servant. Hence, from here, we could see that the terms doulos and the term pais for servant are actually interchangeable. But that's not only the case. Another case is in the case from doulos to the word Diakonos. Now, this can be found in Matthew 22, verse 3 to 14. Now, 
the story goes like this. Christ tells the parable, saying, And sent forth his servants, do laws, to call them that were bidden to the wedding, that they and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants. Again, that's do laws. So, so far, Christ is telling, uh, telling the parable that a man sends forth servants to bid people to his son's wedding. Twice he does so. Okay, then later on, these servants were killed, mocked, spitefully treated, and the word is also doulos. You see, moving on, Christ would say to the servants later on that he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. Go therefore into the highways as many as ye shall find. And bid a bid to the marriage. So those servants, Dulos, went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So, so far the parable goes a man sends servants to do his bidding. One to invite, one to be mistreated, others are going and collecting bad and good people so that the wedding will be furnished with guests. The picture is, it's the servants, doulos, who are actually moving. Now, here's something different that would happen. Later on, the king finds among the guests someone without a wedding garment. Now listen to how the shift goes. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now notice, notice the ship. Then said the king to the servants. You see the difference? This time, the Greek word is diakonos. It wouldn't make sense. Suddenly there's deacons there. Suddenly there's diakonos there. The, deco, the diaconos were told, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, again, it wouldn't make sense if Jesus would be talking to about a man moving doulos, but in the end, talking to diaconos, right? Unless both diaconos and doulos mean the same thing as servant without distinction only with the role and function to serve and perform their master's bidding hence the picture is the word diakonos and the word doulos is actually interchangeable referring to the same term rendered by the king james bible as servant now, another one, last probably, in the book of Matthew. And this is just the book of Matthew. There are more throughout the New Testament. Now, here's an interesting case. The shift from doulos to the word huperites. Okay, this is Matthew chapter 26, verse 51 to 58. The story goes that Jesus and his apostles were arrested in the garden of Gethsemane. Now, this is what happens. Matthew records saying, And behold, one of them which were with Jesus, this is referring to Peter in other Gospels, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck a servant, doulos, of the high priests, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Christ continued, Stinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? And how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? That thus it may be, and that thus it must be. In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are ye come out against us? Uh, are, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? 
I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled, and they that laid hold on Jesus, they, referring to the servants of the high priest, one of which was the one that Peter sliced the ear off, I think the name was Malchus, and they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. It only makes sense because this is his house, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Now, remember, these are the servants of the high priest, okay? But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants again the word now becomes who perites to see the end again it wouldn't make sense in the narrative where it's the doulos who were there that laid hold of jesus to begin with and then when they're in the house of their master and they're gathering around round about they're called a different term unless of course the word who perites and the word doulos is interchangeably meaning the same thing, referring to the King James rendition as servant. By this, we make a clear deduction that the underlying Greek words rendered as servant in the King James Bible are interchangeable being synonyms. Still, the word is still servant rather than slave because not all pais misotos terapon not all those words are rendered as slave only the doulos therefore it would severely impair the rendition of the word if the synonyms are not set in place so by this we truly see that servants refer to them who have the willful choice to render service, referring to employees or one employed to do work, serving their masters, which are their employers, or one who hires for work to be done. And this is under the yoke, which is a contract or agreement between the master and the servant or the employer and the employee in which they have different responsibilities and role for both parties. So, having settled that, we see the instruction of the Apostle Paul for servants regarding their masters. And it is simply this. We read that they are to count their own masters worthy of all honor. Now, how exactly can one count their master, their own master, worthy of all honor? Listen to Apostle Paul's instruction, which is, in summary, obedience, respect, and faithfulness. Paul did say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling. So that's obedience. With fear and trembling refers to respect. And Paul says, in singleness of heart as unto Christ. It's singleness of your heart speaks about your faithfulness to that master. You see, how do we honor our masters after the flesh? Obedience, respect, and faithfulness. This is expounded further in the Colossians epistle. Where Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 24, where Paul re repeats what he says in Ephesians, saying, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now, the faithfulness part is stated by this not with eye service as men pleasers, meaning to say, you don't only work when you're being observed. You work when you are not being observed. You are faithful whether checked or unchecked. You are faithful whether you're seen by your boss or not seen at all. But in singleness of heart, fearing God. Because ultimately, 
the respect that you give your master, the respect you give your employer, the respect you give your boss, is the respect you give to God. Because Paul says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. We have to have that mindset, that in whatever we do, we're not doing it for our master after the flesh. We're not doing it after our boss. We're not doing it for our company. No. We're doing it as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Because ultimately, an important change of mind that needs to happen is this. Christian or believing employees, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Obedience, respect, and faithfulness is given to masters after the flesh because ultimately we serve the Lord Christ. Now this is important to know because Apostle Paul even emphasized this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20 to 23, where Paul says for every servant, saying, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. It's an important mindset to remember. Not only do we serve the Lord Christ, but if we are free, we are the Lord's freeman. We are the Lord's servant. If we are servants, then we are the Lord's freeman. We are free to do what the Lord, our true master, bids us. Remember, we are bought with a price. That price is what Christ has done on the cross, his death for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection, his finished work that availed for us eternal justification and absolute salvation. My friends, we are bought with a price. We no longer possess ourselves. Let us be servants of God. No wonder Apostle Paul says to Titus, in Titus chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, for servants in their time, Paul did say, exhort servants to be obedient to their unto their own masters. That's the word again, obedience. And please them well in all things. That's also in obedience. But here's respect. Not answering again. Not talking back in one sense. And here's the faithfulness part. Not purloining or stealing from your master, but showing all good fidelity. What's the purpose? Paul says that they may adorn the doctrine of God and our Savior in all things. Thus, we make a deduction where we see counting masters after the flesh worthy of all honor adorns the doctrine of God our Savior and honors the name of the God we ultimately serve. Thus, it only makes sense when Paul talks about servants, referring to employees and masters, talking about employers, under the yoke, talking about a contract or agreement, talking about charging us to count our masters or own masters worthy of all honor, the purpose is as Paul states in verse 1, last part, where he says that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, here's a simple truth I want us to see today, which is honoring our masters after the flesh honors the Lord God our Savior and upholds his doctrine. Thus, my challenge for all of you tonight. Are you serving an employer? Remember, 
here's my challenge count your employers worthy of all honor for it honors God our Savior and upholds his doctrine I pray my friends that we would serve our masters after the flesh as we would serve Christ who died for our sins was buried and on the third day rose again an important thing to remember is that ministry is not simply serving in a church service or in the context of the four walls of a local church no 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 it's a good thing to do that there's a time to do that but did you know that as part of the body of Christ we are the church seven days a week 24 hours a day and seven days a week the church is not the Sunday experience the body of Christ is not only limited to the local church it's something greater than that imagine this when we serve our employers as we serve Christ we are doing ministry and in doing ministry we glorify God's name and we adorn the doctrine have you ever come to the point that your boss would ask you why do you serve us this way why are you so loyal and your answer is we serve the lord christ who knows that's an opportunity for us to function as ambassadors for christ bearing the ministry and the message of reconciliation to our bosses and to our office mates workmates doesn't matter what you what work you do we serve the Lord Christ so I pray tonight that you would serve your masters after the flesh as you would serve Christ because this honors God our Savior and upholds and upholds his doctrine I pray that you would consider the truths that you have heard tonight and may these truths simply illumine us even as we consider these things living as the church, the body of Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the truth that we can ponder. And I pray, Father God, that we would indeed consider to serve our masters after the flesh as we serve the Lord Christ. Because this glorifies the name of God our Savior and adorns His doctrine. Father, may the truths that we receive, may it simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcast on Saturday. We continue our study on the Beatitudes for the Body of Christ. And we're going to look at the blessedness of them that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hope you will join us this Saturday. On Monday, we continue our study on the sacred psalm of the saints where we talk about the sweet song of the saved, part two. And next Thursday, we hope to catch you again for another session of the Pauline Pastorate online Bible study on the book of First Timothy. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.